Okay, my friends, and welcome once again to the next episode here, the Red Delta Project podcast, live feed Q&A, helping you escape the diet and exercise rat race through a simplified fundamental approach to diet and exercise and fitness in general. I'm Matt Schifferly, and today's episode is brought to you by the new remote coaching services that I now have available over at reddeltaproject.com. Up until now, basically the only way you could take advantage of me as a coach was to either train with me here in person, here in Denver, Colorado, for your Capra bodyweight training, or just kind of DM me or something in Instagram and just hope and cross your fingers that I could actually respond to you. But now I've got two more options for those who are looking for a little bit of assistance and guidance in their training anywhere in the world. Of course, I'm still offering my in-person coaching here at Capra, here in Denver, Colorado. But I've also now teamed up with Fortify to offer full-time remote coaching from anywhere in the world. And there is a full link down below in the description if you want to learn more about that, as well as my new, quote, micro-coaching sessions. Micro-coaching is for those who want help with some little detail that they're trying to overcome. They want me to look at their routine, or if you want me to check out your technique, or you just have basically some sort of a question about overcoming a specific obstacle. And it's a lot less time intensive and a lot more affordable than full on month to month coaching via Ask Me. And that is also at the same link down below. So I'm really excited to bring these things to you for those who are wanting a little bit more assistance than just my books or just podcasts and Q&As like this here on the RDP channel if you can't quite get to it. Plus, I know a lot of people want to ask questions in a more private setting and a lot more reliable than something like my email or Instagram because uh, I don't check those things all that often when it comes to being able to respond to you. So those are all very fun and exciting new things. And again, the link is down below if you want to check that out. But today we're asking questions. A lot of times when I do these uh, episodes, I have a theme or a topic that I want to really address. And sometimes it feels like the questions just kind of become more of the focus and I get a little bit of sidetracked. And I noticed that was happening a little bit more frequently in the past couple episodes. So I wanted to open up the floor to all of the questions that you have here, make it dedicated about that. And I'll get the ball rolling with a question that came across my desk the other day, basically asking like, how do you prevent rebound from any sort of weight loss attempt? Because at the end of the day, a lot of times losing weight isn't really the hard part. It's keeping it off. It's being able to go back to a state of a homeostatic balance without compensation and rebounding, which is often what does happen when it comes to dieting. And we get stuck in this dietary yo-yo of lose weight, we gain it back. We lose weight, we gain it back. Not to mention the fact that when we are in any type of a restrictive dietary approach, we're essentially training the body how to prevent weight loss in the long term. Because whenever we're doing any sort of long-term restrictive approach for a diet or really cutting calories for a long period of time, the body will adapt and get used to that as it's supposed to, to regain homeostasis. And that essentially means you've now trained your body to not lose weight on that new low-carb, vegan, whatever type of diet you have. Which is why I've always said, that all weight loss methods ultimately in the long run become weight loss prevention methods. And people come to me all the time saying, okay, I was losing weight, but now I'm not. What went wrong? The answer is nothing went wrong. That's entirely how the body's supposed to work when we understand how things operate on a fundamental level. So how do you prevent that regain from happening? Because a lot of times people will start to Uh, prevent the weight loss. They'll stop losing weight. And like, well, what the hell am I on this diet for? And then because they've set up their body to gain to, or essentially to maintain the weight on the diet. Now, when they go back to normal eating style, they regain it back and then some, and it's just kind of this overall uh, helter skelter uh, tailspin into the ground with the goals. And that's why I created my calorie hacking approach which is basically like micro dieting, if you will, where you spend a short period of time, like a day or two, or maybe even a week or two in a purposeful, very uh, noticeable caloric deficit, but then you purposely regain homeostasis on your own with intention. And that way you're learning both weight loss and weight maintenance on your own terms, rather than being forced into it for mother nature. 
So what can we do about this? Well, basically the biggest reason why we often rebound is because we're just dieting way too harshly. The restriction is way too much for way too long. And as a result, we've built up all the stress because regardless of what a lot of times you hear out there with people trying to sell you diets and stuff like that, the bottom line is losing weight is a really hard, stressful thing. It's a little different if you've got a pretty kind of uh, unhealthy attitude to begin with. Like if you're someone who eats nothing but junk food all the time and you cut back on that and you start losing weight, it, you may find it's not all that hard because you're going from extreme healthy un, uh, overeating to more of a moderate approach, which isn't all that hard in many cases. But for the majority of people who are looking to lose weight, when you start to have more of a normal, healthy approach to eating, which is often the case for many of us, then when you cut back, it can be extremely hard and stressful on mind, body, and lifestyle. And the more you spend in that de deficit in building up that stress, the stress builds and builds and builds and builds. And like any type of stress, eventually you will just crack, break, and that's when you get that rebound. So the best thing that you can do to prevent that from happening is to not diet as extreme or as hard as long. You don't let that stress build up nearly as much. And this is different for everybody, especially with calorie hacking. Some people can be in a pretty good caloric deficit for several weeks at a time before they stop. Other people, it might be just a couple of days. And in those cases, it's about a sort of know thyself sort of scenario. If you spend a week for like Monday through Friday, a work week, really clean deficit kind of approach, and then you're just totally losing it on the weekend, will know that and say, okay, that's a bit too much. I'm rebounding like crazy. Maybe I'll do more of a hack from like Monday to Wednesday where I'm really cutting back for just three days. And then you can go back to a more manageable level of a caloric balance. So you're not building up that stress nearly as much. And that's the general approach that I often advocate is yes, it's gonna be slower. Yes, it's not going to be as quick when it comes to your ability to manage and lose weight, but the Upside is that it's going to be a lot more reliable and a lot more consistent in just not letting that stress build up nearly as much. And that's the approach that I usually recommend. Let's get to some good questions here. Let me get my reading glasses on here, my little nose pinchers. I always feel like Benjamin Franklin whenever I have these on. I feel like um, all time oldie, you know, should be looking over like tax book sheets and stuff like that. <laughs> So Ms. Arca is saying, Matt, can I come work out with you? Sure, absolutely. I always put out the invite. If you ever are finding yourself in Denver, Colorado, my friends, by all means, hit me up you know, in the Instagram. Send me an email, reddeltaproject at gmail.com. I'm a really busy dude. I'm just going to put it out there right now. Like when friends get together and they're like, oh, are you watching this TV show or this series and stuff? I'm like, dude, who in the world has enough time to watch TV? I have a hard time watching a 10 minute YouTube video. The other day I got a uh, email from a friend of mine. She's like, dude, this guy was hilarious. Check this out. And it took me four days till I found the ability to just watch that one video. But yeah, hit me up if you're ever here in Denver and we'll get a workout in and then go out and maybe grab a drink. Or if you don't drink, we'll go out and grab some food or something like that, we'll have a good old time. And if you do have a good amount of time and I have some opening my schedules, I'll take you guys out to Philip S. Morris Park, which has one of the best calisthenics gyms here in Colorado. It's fantastic. Fair enough is asking, hey Matt, don't have a question, just wanna say I appreciate your input. Thank you very much and I appreciate your appreciation. I listen a lot on uh, my paper route, greetings from Germany, oh, love Germany. Leonberg is one of my favorite cities. I've been there a number of times. I've got friends who live out there. Fantastic food, really good beer. It's a great place. I, I should get back there sometime. Leonis, it's good to see you again, my friend, from last week, saying, hey, Matt, can you suggest some sustainable and easy-to-make meals and snacks when trying to eat on a surplus? Really appreciate your tips and hard work. Uh, so a lot of times when people are looking at snacks, we get into the snacky foods, right? And this is one of the reasons why I'm not a big snack kind of food guy. For me personally, I will meal prep or I will make food. And if I'm going to have a quote snack, it's just a smaller meal. Like I'm eating meal things like sandwiches. Uh, I've got a couple of little things in my cupboards. I got some granola bars. I got some nuts. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of these perfect bars that you can get out here, especially like at Costco, which are basically like a compressed nut butter in a bar. They're like 300 calories a piece, which is pretty cool. And uh, those might be a bit of a snack for me. But for the most part, I like a good full on meal half the time. When I was bike racing in college, I didn't snack. I just ate more meals, like full on meals. I was visiting this, this school cafeteria more than I was visiting some of my classes where I'd load up my tray and eat, and then I'd go to class and come back a few hours later and eat again. So I recommend eating more like whole food, like meals like that. Sandwiches are a good one that I like to do a lot. I'll just line right up with a, like make three or four sandwiches right in a row, wrap them up in saran wrap, have those for the day kind of thing. You know, that scene in the, well, maybe I'm dating myself here, you know, but in the breakfast club where Emilio Estevez character, he's the wrestler with the big appetite and he's pulling out one sandwich after another from a full on, he didn't have a brown paper bag for his lunch. He had a full on brown paper grocery bag. If you remember back in the day, you could get grocery bags and brown paper bags. That literally was me in, in high school. I had like three sandwiches that I would eat before uh, the end of the school day, along with other things like apples and cookies and things like that. So that's usually what I recommend when people are trying to eat more is make some more sandwiches, you know, have a couple more Tupperwares of whatever meal you're making. When I meal prep, I'll make a big old cauldron of food on my stovetop and I'll just pour everything I can in this thing. I got pasta, I got chicken, I got beef, I got sausage, I got veggies galore and stuff. And I'll make a ton of these containers for it. And I'll have a couple of those containers, especially if I know I'm gonna be out for most of the day that I can just quickly heat and eat sort of thing. So focus on those sorts of things. Because a lot of times I find when people are like, oh, I'm trying to build muscle, they're eating like these little protein bars and protein shakes and things. And they're, it, no, dude, come on. it's. That's not like really satisfying food. Like go out and get like a full on meal kind of stuff. That's what you want to make your staple for your meals. It's really hard to eat adequately when you're basically eating processed supplements all of the time. And if H by five saying, I love what you do. Thank you very much. Just wondering, are there any options, ways towards accessibility? I have total blindness. So graphics with grind style and other publications is hard to access. A very good question uh, there, A and D. I'm, I don't believe I've been too accommodating with that sort of thing. And I'm sorry about that. I, I just haven't really considered it too much. And I, I know a lot of times people have said, oh, convert your books into like audio books and stuff. And I'm like, how in the world, you know, do I convert a book that's mostly images and graphics to audio kind of thing. Like this book here, my second one, Smart Bodyweight Training, has over 500 images in it. It's really hard to convert that sort of thing. Uh, so I'll look into ways I can do that uh, for a little bit of a project in the next coming months. But uh, I'm afraid I just don't have a whole lot available as aside from, you know, like, again, in-person coaching and stuff like that, that I can help you with. I would encourage you that is see if You've got anybody who can help you in person near where you live that may be able to take some of my information or add to it and build something on top of that. Andre is saying, hey, tips, ideas for combining calisthenics with kettlebells. For example, I superset kettlebell presses, my pike push-ups. the end of the day, I, per, I do kettlebell swings for the posterior activation. All right. So remember, when we're looking at different methodology here, folks, kettlebells, calisthenics, free weights, machines, and stuff, a lot of times we're fundamentally doing the same thing with just a different vehicle. So we're traveling the same path, same route. I know it looks really different, like a kettlebell snatch may look different from a bridge, but fundamentally, as you rightfully pointed out, you're still talking about posterior, or as we call it, extension chain work. You know, kettlebell press, pike push-ups, they're essentially the same thing. Is there a little bit of difference? Yeah, exactly. But a lot of times we get caught up in these nuanced little differences and think they're more significant and impactful than they really are. Because I can pretty much guarantee if you spend a year doing overhead presses or a year doing just pike push-ups, you're pretty much going to get the same result either way. Is there going to be difference? Yes. Is it really going to matter? Probably not. So when we look at fundamentally the same basic movement patterns, I just switch and swap. I just swap them out. 
So it was like, okay, today, you know, Monday, I'm going to do extension work. Uh, I'm going to do back bridges and hip bridges. Okay, great. And then I'm going to do posterior or extension work again on Thursday. Okay, then I might do kettlebell uh, swings and some snatches. Okay, good. All right. Wednesday, that's push day. Well, I'm going to do progressive push-ups and overhead presses. Just simply switch and swap. When you got the basic fundamental movement pattern, the same between the two methodologies, you just mix and match them. And if you find yourself kind of gravitating towards one, like, oh, I don't know, these hip bridges, I just can't quite feel it, my glutes. But man, those kettlebell swings, especially like the one arm alternating swing, my glutes are on fire. They just fire up. Well, then go more towards what feels best is working for you. And so if your body is telling you, this is working better for me, listen to it. <laughs> you know, be able to go with what's best. Because a lot of times people will get their best results saying like, okay, this methodology is best for this type of training and this methodology is best for this muscle group and so on. You want to definitely pay attention to feedback that your body's getting and then just mix and match however you like. Michael Lewis Fisher is saying, looking at your books and what book is a good starting book? 62 years old and strength uh, a couple of months. Very good to hear from Michael. So you can start with anything because all of my books are designed for beginners. Uh, and experts alike. I have nothing where it's like, okay, now that you've been training for 10 years, this is the book to start off with. No, of course not. I write everything for everybody. And it's just going to kind of fit you wherever you're at. It's just more of what kind of information or approach are you looking for? Oh, I want to build muscle and strength. And I just got these brand new gymnastics rings or suspension straps. Okay, great. Then, you know, suspension calisthenics would be a good place to start. Or it's like, I'm, I want to save time and I want to work out more efficiently, micro workouts, okay? Or it could just be something along the lines of um, getting into um, isometrics. Well, then overcoming isometrics would be a good place to start. They all fundamentally basically do the same thing, though. They're all about muscle and strength. They're all basically about body weight training. Of course, some things are a little bit more generic as far as at a fundamental approach, like be fit and live free doesn't abide by any particular method because a fundamental approach means that you recognize how you can get in the best shape of your life and then just do whatever method you want. Eat however you want, train however you want, that's best for you. But for the most part, everything is about building muscle and strength with body weight training and it's just going in towards a particular direction. Generally though, if you're like, I wanna build muscle and strength, body weight training, pretty new to it, I always recommend either progressive and weighted calisthenics is a good place to start because fundamentally you just have to know that information in order to build muscle and strength. Grind style calisthenics is, is of course what I base everything off of. And if you just kind of want an overall view of everything, smart body weight training is a good place to go. I mean, literally when I wrote this thing, it took me almost two years and I was like, I'm gonna put everything I can possibly conceive of about building muscle and strength and body weight training in one book. So it's kind of like, this is the Bible and everything else goes into those areas in much more detail. So that's a, where I would start if I were you. Hopefully that answers your question. I am dust, I am dust saying, yo Matt, can you tell us the real method to keep all the work done forever? Winehouse losing everything. Uh, every time I have big mile, I'm in constant, oh, you didn't quite finish. Da, da, da. Finish that thought and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Timas, Timothys saying, hey Matt, can you do a video about isometric hamstring curls? Yeah, one of the best ways to do this, real simple, really, really simple, is you lay on the floor, put your feet flat on the floor, kind of like a bridge, uh, you're about to do a hip bridge, lift your hips up, and then just squeeze the floor together, like you're trying to squeeze between your heels and your shoulder blades. That's basically an isometric hamstring curl. You can elevate your heels, and that's going to make it a little bit more uh, impossible to pull into your heels. Just make sure you're not going to have your heels up on something that you're gonna like pull towards you like a weight bench or something that's gonna tip over. But that's literally just about it. And if you wanna add a little bit more resistance, you can put some weight on your hips. You can also just go with a single leg version, which is pretty hard. And table bridges are a good way to do that too. You have your hands on the ground, that's your classic hip bridge, and then you just lift up. But basically, you lift up your hips, squeeze the floor. There you go, with your hamstrings. It's a good way to go about it. I'm sure I've got that somewhere out there. Uh, I'm assuming I do. I'm assuming I do. Go, if you Google on my, or uh, you search on my site, isometric hamstring curls, you should be able to find several videos. And uh, yeah, that's a, 
something I recommend usually people start off gently because isometrics are pretty powerful for working a muscle very hard. And most people are not used to working their hamstrings even close to that intensity. So there's a tendency to uh, cramp up a little bit. Just a fair warning. Ariel is saying, hey, Matt, I do lots of walking. What gives me uh, hamstring pain? Recommendations. Check to your, see your glutes. Make sure your glutes are engaged when you're doing that. Your hamstrings may be a little overloaded. Also, check your posture while you're walking as well. Uh, because if you are hunching over a little bit or you're kind of falling forward, you might be having a little bit of some compensation with that. Basically, look at what in your legs is not carrying the load. Whenever we have a muscle group that is getting overloaded, it usually means other muscles are not doing their job. So quads and glutes, in this case, may be the area that you are not quite working on. And uh, second, secondly, I'll piggyback that off of the previous answer where we were talking about hamstring curls and stuff. A lot of hip bridges that I covered in my video last week for the uh, dynamic, the overcome, or blah, the progressive calisthenics hip bridge exercise for the glutes and hamstrings. Lots of times when people do that, they will feel it almost exclusively in their hamstrings and almost not at all in their glutes. And that should be kind of 50-50 or maybe even a little more glute dominant, which usually means they need to regress to an easier exercise to get their glutes fired off. So I would uh, definitely uh, look to getting the glutes to engage a little bit more, and that should take some of the stress out of your hamstrings. Proud Misfit saying, hey Matt, hope you're keeping well with them. Thank you. I'm getting into doing suspension training hamstring curls. Is it okay to take a time first to build hamstring strength with hips low and build up to the hips up. Yeah, that's your standard progression for that exercise. When you do hamstring curls suspended, many people lack the hip strength, stability, and glute strength to keep the body locked in place as they pull in. So as a result, they pull in, but their hips stay you know, just a few inches off of the floor. It's perfectly fine to do that. It's just easier. And so you do that for several weeks and then you can start to lift your hips up a little bit more and eventually get to the point where you're not flexing your hips at all with that exercise and your body stays locked and uh, solid throughout the entire thing. And you're going to get that a lot more in your hamstrings uh, for that as well because you're lifting more weight. Master Dave is saying, hey, Matt, do you always use weighted calisthenics for training your squat chain? No, uh, not at all. My squat chain is not something that I use weighted a lot, although most people will find that they're going to want to use weighted calisthenics for that just because the legs are really strong. And a lot of times also people have mobility and stability challenges that prevent them from adequately working their squat chain with a lot of progressive exercises, pistol squats, hover lunges, that sort of thing. So they're going to find that it's a kind of a way to shortcut to heavier levels of resistance without necessarily addressing those inadequacies in their stability and mobility. So it's a good thing to do. Just don't over rely on it because you do want that mobility to improve and the stability to improve. But uh, for the most part, uh, don't use it as a crutch is what I'm saying. Use it as an asset, but still keep working on utilizing things in a progressive nature. There should always be or mostly always be some sort of a body weight only level leg technique that can still really challenge you. Joseph Bello, it's good to see you as always, my friend. Uh, he's coming in saying, Matt, I was thinking of upper body, lower body split, lower body two days, uh, lower body two days or three days, push, pull, squat, and do pushing one day pull another squat third day. Yeah, there's a million ways you can program, my friends. Splits can be programmed a hundred different ways. And for the most part, they're all gonna do the same thing. It's not really gonna matter all that much one way or the other, uh, because generally a, a split variation that works better for you is just because you like that variation better or it works better in your schedule. So I could be saying like, okay, I'm gonna do an upper lower body split and I'm doing it in the summer, but then I find it's like, gosh, you know, I'm skiing a whole lot during the winter. My legs are shot. And if I have this lower body day, I'm just blasting the hell out of my legs, which means my legs are going to be tired for skiing or I'm going to be so tired from skiing that I don't want to do a full committed lower body day. So I'm going to go with instead of upper lower push pull or something like that. 
most of the time programming, uh, effective programming in a workout is literally just working around your schedule. That's literally what makes most workouts work or wor workout programs work and split uh, training and scheduling. When I'm working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, I'm literally like, what works in your schedule? Well, I like to work out this time. It's like, I'm sorry, I can't meet you that time. I'm all booked up. It's like, well, what about this time? Okay, well, we'll work your upper body on Monday rather than Tuesday. Why? Just because it works with your schedule. So a lot of times people get really caught into thinking that the scheduling of your workouts or your splits is going to really matter for your results. And it's not. It's literally just scheduling around things so that you can get the workouts in. And that comes from experience. But as long as you're just getting in the work, it really doesn't matter all that much for most people how you get the work in. So get whatever you can for your, for your uh, schedule. <clears throat> Star Wolf and 13 saying we stretch three times a day in my job. I work in um, medical tech manufacturing. Need to stretch time and have incorporated stuff you've taught us for the few years. Thanks for all the content. Fantastic, my friend. Because, yeah, you don't even need a schedule, really. You don't need a work or routine. I mean, I haven't followed a regular workout routine in years myself. Just getting the work in and to any degree, however you can, goes a long way. I was just talking about this with a couple of fellow coaches the other day. And they were remarking about how if they have like a weak leg or trouble doing an exercise or something, they'll be sure to just demonstrate it more uh, while in class. Like, oh man, my right leg feels weaker than my left leg, particularly on this leg exercise. So then what they would do is every time they demonstrated the exercise, they'd do it on their weaker leg. And within a few weeks, it wouldn't be their weaker leg anymore. They weren't working out. They weren't training it different. They weren't doing anything specific. They were just saying, every time I demonstrate it, I'm just going to do it on that one leg and it fixed the problem. Because remember, we just need to be taking action. It doesn't need to be in some sort of a specific like routine or program or something like that. Cool guy saying, Matt, what do you think about runner's high? Is it good for health? How can I reach that? Yeah, Good luck with that. I've never achieved that sort of thing <laughs> from running myself. Yeah, of course, we want to have good endorphins and everything. When we are working out, uh, we can get a lot of the good feel-good chemicals going through our body with any kind of training. I never understood why they call it a runner's high. It can be achieved with any kind of training to any degree just because you're feeling good. You're feeling good with your body, and you're feeling good about what you're accomplishing, and life is good kind of, kind of vibes. So you don't need to be running specifically. You don't need, need to be training any specific way. But the bottom line is, yes, it's definitely good for you. It's definitely something that can be beneficial. But like anything that's good and powerful, it can also become addictive. And if you become too much of a dependent on it in order to just feel good in life in general, that can lead to some issues. But that's really, really making some assumptions and kind of grasping at straws here. But yeah, if you can uh, get it, then go for it. And if you're not getting it from running, try it with biking, try it with hiking, try it with yoga, try it with calisthenics. It's not specific. It doesn't happen from any particular type of training. And it will happen more often if you have just a healthier body and mind too. So take care of yourself, get plenty of good sleep, plenty of good food. Don't abuse yourself. Don't have like a lot of negative thoughts always going through your head and everything like that, watching the news 24 seven, the more negative your mental, emotional and physical state is, the harder it's going to be to reach that kind of high. So make sure that you are uh, taking good care of yourself, my friends. Aaron is saying, how do I prevent golfer's elbow when doing pull-ups? So a lot of times stress in the elbow is lack of activation in the back. And that's very, very common. I would hesitate, but yeah, screw it. I would say if you took a hundred people and had them do pull-ups, they're all doing it with less back activation than, than they should be. You'd probably need at least 500 to a thousand people until you found someone with proper back activation. So make sure, remember that your back muscles pull everything back and in towards your spine. So when you're doing pull-ups and rows and stuff, you want to feel like your muscles are literally squeezing your spine squeezing towards your spine, your shoulder blades and everything like that. When your shoulders come up, when they are forward and when they are wide, that's when you get that misalignment in your elbows and you're causing that pain. 
So you, you should be able to squeeze your back. And again, this is where bridges come into play. Bridges teach you how to do that. But a lot of people have a lot of trouble for that sort of thing. A lot of people couldn't do it. If you ask them to squeeze their back, they couldn't do it just because it's one of those things that most of us are very poor in their proficiency for. Remember, your success in most of your strength training depends on how well you can engage and use your muscles in the first place. And no, exercises are not a reliable way to do that because exercises do not tell your muscles what to do. It's like asking the road to tell your car how to drive. Exercise is merely the application for how well you're using your muscles. It's your nervous system that drives your muscles. And most of us are never taught how to do that, which means that for the majority of us, our success and safety in our workouts is down to just dumb luck, just pure luck about whatever neuromuscular proficiency you've just got. And most of us are never taught how to do that better. That's why so many of my books are about addressing that. That's overcoming isometrics, about improving neuromuscular proficiency, grind style calisthenics, the four phases in every workout is how do you use your muscles better? Because if you're not trying to use your muscles better, you just get caught in the treadmill of using your muscles the same way every single time. And you're just always going to get the same result. Your elbows are always going to hurt. Your elbows are always going to get injured. Your lack of back strength and development in your back is always going to be poor. And no amount of work and no amount of fancy programming or tools or equipment is ever going to fix it. You're, but that's the great thing about neuromuscular proficiency is once you do improve that ability to pack your shoulders, to really stabilize and stuff, suddenly everything works. Every workout program works. Every tool works. Every exercise works kind of thing. That's the beauty of neuromuscular proficiency. It will make or break your effectiveness of your fitness. And that's why I'm such a big advocate for it. Meh is coming in. That's a neat avatar there on the beer bottles. Hey, Matt. Uh, when should we start using weights and pull-ups and dips? Good question. Good question. I always tell people, you know, if, if you're looking at an exercise going like, I wonder if I could do a little more. I've, I could add some weight or four. Just go. Just try it. Just see what happens kind of thing. But always remember that you're never going to get stronger adding weight to your dips and pull-ups. You get stronger by doing better dips and pull-ups. And the whole point of weight, right? I got my new... Got my new Kensui plates. This weight plate will not do anything for helping me build muscle and strength. It is completely useless if I strap it to my weight vest for helping me build muscle and strength. It's just a chunk of, well, I'm pretty sure this is steel. I was going to say iron, but I am very, very sure I would bet anybody a million dollars this plate will do absolutely nothing for me whatsoever in building muscle and strength. However, it is extremely effective in challenging my ability to do a proper pull-up. And it's by trying to overcome that challenge by, again, my nervous system driving my muscles, trying to get a full range of motion, trying to keep my shoulders packed, trying to get everything stable and improving my back tension with the weight. That's what makes it effective. So whenever you're looking at, should I add weight? The whole, don't forget that the whole point of that weight is to try and effectively break your technique and you're trying to fight that technique. And so, you, yeah, sure, go for it, add weight, but never make the weight the goal because it's not, the weight's not going to do you any good. The technique you're using is what's good. And by adding the weight and you can start really slow and small, that's what's going to be the thing you want to have as a focus. And again, I cover that much more in my book, uh, Progressive and Weighted Calisthenics. Wish I knew that stuff back in the day. I would have avoided a lot of injuries. Joseph Bello saying, how does micro coaching uh, work? It's real simple. If you go to the site, again, down below, reddeltaproject.com slash coaching. On the very right, there's the Ask Me little logo. And it just simply says uh, micro uh, coaching. And just click on that and it'll take you right to the page that you just simply fill out. It's got your question. You could post videos. You could post pictures, uh, your, what you want to work on. And it just sends it directly to my email with a special notification that I have set up on my phone. So I know I'm going to get it and I will get back to you within 24 hours because I honestly don't check email very much. But I have it set up so it's going to say, hey, there's a priority email that you have to address here. 
and then I respond to you and I'll respond in words if I feel that's not uh, doable uh, with photos, videos, whatever kind of thing. And for the fee, you get two different responses back and forth. And that's how it works. Uh, Leopold saying, Helmut, just wanted to show that the worst thing I have done is to combine martial arts, specifically hitting the sandbag kickboxing style with calisthenics burpees in the same rounds. Pain in the knees. Sorry to hear about that, man. That sucks. I would say the big mistake is doing burpees at all. <laughs> I used to train a guy who was a martial artist and he would be doing just exactly that. He'd be doing, um, you know, bag work and he'd be hitting the Muay Thai bag and everything like that. And then out of the blue, he'd just start doing burpees. And I, one time I stopped him, I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm getting ready for this contest I got coming up and everything. And I was like, are you going to be doing burpees in the contest? He's like, no, no, no. But, you know, it's good for conditioning. And I'm like, if you're not topping out your heart rate on that, just go faster. Like, it, you might as well train the thing you're trying to be good at. I don't know anybody who's going to be benefiting from doing better burpees. But I was like, you're kind of slowing down on your, you know, right leg there with your kicks and you're, you know, getting in and you're punching and you're kicking and then you're not getting away. Like, there's a hundred things you could do from a martial arts perspective that's going to increase your conditioning. Train martial arts for that sort of thing. You don't need to do like different things. It'd be like if someone was in the gym and they're sparring and they're doing this, like, okay, everybody stop and now build a big tower out of bricks. Well, why? It's like, because it's hard and it's going to take poise and, and control. And it's like, yeah, why are we stopping our training to do this random labor? And that's exactly what is going on in most people people's cases. It's one of the reasons I did not like uh, the uh, circuit training uh, styles and uh, Metcons and the CrossFits and everything like that. It's like we had this great workout until we decided to go and run down the street. <laughs> like, why are we doing that? That has nothing to do with what I'm training for. Remember, when you don't know what you're doing, anything that offers a lot of hard work just sounds like a good idea. Hard work becomes the refuge for people who are incompetent and don't know what they're trying to get out of their training. If you're a martial artist and you're training, train martial arts. If you're trying to do conditioning, do something that's going to be a little bit easier and safer uh, rather than just kind of juggling or things around. But basically what you're doing is you're interrupting your martial arts training for just random labor <laughs> kind of things. And a lot of times, again, when we're not concerned with proficiency and how well we're doing something, that's when our stability goes downhill. That's basically when your workout objective is to just kick your ass, just take a hammer to your hands. It's the same thing. You're just going to beat yourself up. You don't care what you're actually doing. You're just doing work for work's sake. In that case, just go dig ditches. You know, if you want to just do ma manual labor, go in the field and like harvest you know, avocados or something like that, get paid for it kind of thing. Because unfortunately, that's what a lot of people do is they're not doing training. They're just doing manual labor in a gym. But I love, uh, went off a little bit on tangent there, but thank you very much for the feedback. Gatsu, it's good to see as always. Hey, Matt, doctors uh, concluded I have a mal uh, malignant in my hand below the pinky area. was a ball at first, now can barely feel it. Got it after doing more diamond push-ups. Ever get any of those? Nope, uh, none of those. A lot of times these sorts of things just come up due to just how we're built too. You know, just the structure of your hands, your bones. I knew a guy one time, he had this wrist issue that just developed from rock climbing. And he was like, what do I do to prevent this? What do I, what caused it and everything? And people were just, just how you're built, dude. I don't know, something about your wrist. It just came about, you know, a lot of times we think there's got to be a good rhyme or reason behind why a lot of these things start to develop. And um, no, a lot of times there's not. <laughs> Sometimes it's just the random chance that has this sort of thing. T.S. Long is saying, if I'm trying to build muscle, but not counting macros, what happens if I don't eat enough? Will I still get stronger, just not bigger? Yeah, I mean, if you're not eating enough, uh, it's going to be harder to build muscle. But generally, in my experience, when people are training hard enough, they're going to eat enough. Because remember, a lot of times when people are like, oh, you've got to eat more to build muscle, we're talking just a few hundred extra calories a day. And if you're not really tracking calories or your macros, chances are very good. You're going to eat that extra few hundred calories if your body's asking for it anyway. That's nothing. That's a, such a small little difference that you're probably going to do that without even noticing it. I mean, it's one of those perfect bars I talked about. 
know, my diet's fairly stable, but if I had an extra four or 500 calories in a day, I'm not going to notice. I'm not going to know that. And I know that sometimes when my training gets really dialed in, I'm getting plenty of sleep. I'm getting plenty of good recovery. My mindset is good. My attitude is good. My training goes to a whole nother level. And when that happens, you better believe my body is asking for food. You know, the joke with me and some of my friends were always let, uh, when that would happen, I would have like a tapeworm in my stomach. You know, I, I'd come to the gym with like extra food and they'd be like, oh, tapeworm's back. Huh, Matt? I'm like, yeah. You know, I went to uh, uh, the gym a uh, few months ago and I was going out. My buddy was like, hey, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to go to Smashburger. I'm going to get two double cheeseburgers and a large fry and a Coke before my next session. And he's like, oh, I'll join you. And I wolfed all that down, came back, did one session for an hour. And then I went home and had a full dinner on top of that. <laughs> okay. That's when I know I'm making gains when my body is in that real anabolic. Cause it's like, I just keep eating. I'm just hungry all the time. And don't put the cart before the horse. I'm always telling people when your body is trying to build muscle, let it ask for the food first. Don't just eat. Whenever we're in this mindset of got to eat a lot, got to eat a lot, got to eat a lot. That's how you overeat. That's how you just get fatter kind of thing. Because for the most part, building muscle is really, really, really slow and not something that requires a whole lot more food unless you're in one of those scenarios that I was in where your training just levels up like crazy. But for the most part, we could just have a fairly normal diet and we're good. Because your ability to build muscle, unless you're having a really restrictive diet, depends much more on training than diet. And eating enough, as long as you're getting three squares and you're eating to satisfy your hunger and everything, should be pretty good. You shouldn't have to worry about it too much. Mark, what they inspired to create this channel, my YouTube channel. So this is something I've been doing for well over like 20 years or so, long before we had you know, reliable cameras in our smartphones and everything like that. But, you know, I've always, as a trainer, I've always wanted to share my stories and share what I've learned and stuff because I've gone through a lot of crap and a lot of hardship in my journey to live a healthier life and incorporate diet and exercise. And it's just human nature that when you've overcome obstacles and hardships and difficulties in your life, you want to help those who are also struggling with those same challenges. And so, that was always my motivating factor. And it was something that was hard to do. When, when you're training one-on-one, -on -one, you can only help so many people. You know, I might help five, six people in an average day, but I can make a single YouTube video and help thousands of people, even millions of people if enough people watch that video. So it was always about leveraging the ability to help a lot of people and have a good amount of information stored where I can just point people to a YouTube video and say, it's kind of a complicated topic. I've, I've talked about this 80 million times. Just go watch this video because <laughs> I don't want to have to explain it again today kind of thing. So th those are the motivations behind starting these sorts of things. Sister Cinnamon, Cinnamon, not Cinnamon, Cinnamon. <laughs> Saying, I'm a beginner who's recently discovered your channel. Welcome, my friend. I really appreciate that you refuse to give blanket answers in form of how flexible fitness is and avoid dogma. Thank you very much. That's the whole point, because that's the stuff that gets us really screwed over. You know, when we fall into these traps of thinking, we got to get this stuff just right, or else I'm going to like kill my gains and all that sort of thing. That's when we give into the fear mongering. And we start to get lost into a dogmatic approach that it's got to be done this very specific, precise way and stuff. It's like, oh, it's like, dude, I guarantee it. If you're doing push-ups and you're working your chest and your triceps, I don't care how you're doing them. If there's any measure of progressive variable there, you're working your muscles harder than before, you're creating a stimulus to build muscle and strength. I don't care how you're doing it. <laughs> I don't care what your program looks like and stuff. Now, yeah, as you get more fine-tuned into the details to keep improving things over time, yeah, it's good to know these things. But yeah, it's not rocket science. Remember that the fundamental processes that are in control of whether or not you're losing weight and building muscle and stuff, these are things that have always been happening to human beings since the dawn of time completely by accident. And we never sent a rocket into outer space by accident. You know, I mean, unless someone accidentally pushed the button or something. But 
rocket science, brain surgery, these things that are not going to happen by accident, but losing weight, building muscle, all this stuff, this has happened for the most part purely by chance and luck to almost every human being on earth since the dawn of time. Even if you know nothing about science and stuff. So when people are like, oh, you've got to get it just right. You've got to know exactly the science behind weight loss in order to stand a chance. No, you don't. There's lots of people out there who are jacked and ripped and strong as hell. And if you were like, what are you supersetting this with? And they'd be like, what the hell's a superset? Like, I don't know that I just grab the bar and I just do a bunch of pull-ups or I'm just loading up these hay bales or whatever. Like it happens on autopilot. It happens by accident all the time. So the only way that happens is if it's something that is a relatively low hanging fruit, a low bar to clear. And we think that the bar is way up here and it's really complicated and it's not. Dominic Brendel is saying, hey Matt, a question regarding nutrition. If I follow a vegetarian diet, should I supplement with creatine? I train for muscles and general fitness. It might be an idea to uh, go for. Uh, creatine is one of those few things that some people are better off doing. Because remember that it doesn't give you anything outside of what you would normally get. You know, the creatine, is, all you're doing is you're topping up your creatine phosphate levels a little bit faster. That's all it does, which can be beneficial depending on how often and how intensely you're training. And if you are not getting any animal products, which typically have a little bit more creatine in them, then yeah, it might help. And, and it's really a back and forth sort of thing. You know, some people benefit a lot from creatine. Some people, it does absolutely nothing for them. They're just not training hard enough and often enough. And they're just resting enough that they are supplying their muscles well enough, uh, replenishing because you are going to replenish the creatine levels in your muscles, no matter what you do. I mean, creatine doesn't, uh, the reason why creatine works is why everything in fitness works. It doesn't do anything. It just makes whatever happens happen a little faster or slower. That's the only option we have in fitness. Diet and exercise doesn't do a damn thing. All it does is it takes the process that's already happening and it speeds it up and slows it down. That's why it, quote, works. So when you're taking creatine, you're just replenishing a little faster. Will that matter in your workouts? Who knows? The only way to know is to give it a try. So that's why it's one of the few things I often tell people, yeah, sure, go out, get some cheap creatine monohydrate. You know, it's, it's really cheap, or at least it should be. You know, if someone's like, oh, I got this proprietary creatine blend that's $80 for this thing. I was like, no, dude. I remember uh, probably not so much nowadays, but you could get a bottle of creatine for like 10 bucks, you know, for six weeks worth. Now I think you get more of it, but it's like $22. It's cheap. It's really easy. Just a spoonful of it a day. You know, there you go. And again, listen to the feedback. If you're just taking it and your workouts pretty much feel the same and your recovery feels the same and everything, eh, it's probably not really that needed. But uh, if it is impactful, then it should give you some pretty strong feedback right away of like, Whoo, wow, I feel a hell of a lot better in my workouts now. Well, then mazel tov. Good for you. Christina Smith coming on the show saying, I'm a 45-year-old female wanting to be able to do a pull-up this year. I was wondering if you could suggest some exercise that would enable me to achieve this goal or being gentle on the joints. So remember what I was talking about earlier, in case you weren't here before, about squeezing your back. A lot of people have trouble engaging their lats and their back muscles, and that's why a lot of people struggle with pull-ups, is because your back muscles perform a lion's share of the work in most pulling compound movements, pull-ups, rows, that sort of thing. And if those muscles just aren't working, you're primarily using shoulders and arms, and those muscles just are not big enough to ever be strong enough to be proficient at that movement. You're just never going to get there. So isometric rows or even isometric pull-ups. So if you're at a gym or you've got like, you know, one of these iso trainers or something and you just loop it around and you just pull down on it as hard as you possibly can, that's going to be going a long way at helping you engage your back to a much higher degree. Also use pull-ups, do pull-ups. The best way to get good at something is to do it specifically. So use progressive pull-up technique. The seated pull-up or where your feet are on the ground or up on a bench or something like that is a staple that I encourage many people to practice. Most people should be doing pull-ups with their feet on the ground, in my humble opinion. 
Most people I see in the gym doing full-on pull-ups are like, you have no business doing that. Your technique is terrible. Your activation is terrible. Your range of motion is terrible. You're going to get a lot more from a regress technique. Again, covering that stuff in my progressive and weighted calisthenics book. And that's the stuff that's probably going to get you there is the isometrics. Just make sure everything's on and engaged and use regressed pull-up techniques and get really use, used to it. And that's going to get you a lot further to making that happen this year. Keep in touch with me on Instagram about your progress. I want to make sure you get that. Uh, not the, this year. We should get. We should be getting your pull up by uh, June. Let's say. Let's make it a goal to get it uh, for June. Michael Dropway Dad is saying, "Hey Matt, still attempting to increase my grip strength. Notice that my left side is significantly weaker than my right side. Any tips on the master trainer? Yeah. When we're looking at our grip strength, there's a couple things because I know you're doing grip specific work, which is good." that that's a very good way to go about it. I had a question the other day about these NOS trainers. You know, we've got these twisting handles and it's like, well, when I do rows and pull-ups and stuff, my grip gives out because yeah, that's going to be harder on the grip. And my response to that is, well, just keep going. <laughs> You're going to get stronger grip from that sort of thing. Uh, but in your case, I would look at not so much the grip muscles, but the rest of the muscles in the pull chain on that side, uh, which one was on your Left side is significantly weaker. So take a look at the muscles on the left side of your back, your shoulders, your biceps. Are you engaging those to the same degree? And are you packing and stabilizing your shoulder there? So if you're doing your, your bent over and your grip strength and your sh right shoulder is packed down and back and your left shoulder is elevated and protracted, that's just going to be a weaker technique because you're not as stable. You're not using your back nearly as much. Look at the other muscles in the pull chain, especially also if you're doing ground-based work or you're standing. What about your glutes? What about your hamstrings? Are you twisting? Are you compensating with body position in some way? Basically what I'm saying, Michael, is you're using your weaker side differently than your stronger side. And this is actually the ironic thing, is a lot of times when people have a quote weaker side, the muscles, the actual muscles in that side are actually stronger because you've been using or they've been using some sort of a uh, compensated technique. So the muscles actually got stronger, but the actual action is weaker. So then when they get their shoulder packed and their glutes engaged and it's much more stable, suddenly that side is, bow, it's way stronger because now you're using those muscles in a stronger environment and, or a more stable environment physically. And suddenly that's much stronger and the other side's the weaker side, right? So I would look at the other muscles involved in other words uh, for that sort of thing. Casper is saying, don't have a question, but just want to say thank you for all this free content. You're welcome there, Casper. It's been invaluable for me for years at this point. I'm glad you could stomach the sound of my voice for this long. Huge shout out from Denmark. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it very much. T.S. Long is saying, does blood flow restriction work because it creates hypoxia in the muscles stimulating stem cells, uh, angiogenesis and mitogenesis to supply more blood to area. Uh, to be honest with you, I have no idea. And to honestly, I don't think anybody really knows uh, because I'm assuming when you say work, does it help build muscle? And to a very large degree, we're still unsure about how this whole muscle building thing works. We've got a lot of correlations for muscle growth, like, okay, if we get more, you know, metabolic damage, there seems to be a little more growth. If we take it more to fit, there seems to be a little more growth and stuff. But to be honest with you, I don't think anybody knows why it really works or if it, if it works and what conditions it works. And it's still very much a, a new area and it's still very much something that it's like, okay, now we know why it works. And then they'll test that variable. And it's like, well, that didn't work either. So who the hell knows? <laughs> who the hell knows? And we may be getting a little lost in the weeds here. It's kind of like, well, it may not really matter why it works. It may not really matter exactly what the mechanism is, as long as we can just simply use it a reliable method. It's like, I do it, it works, good. Like, I don't know how, you know, my computer here works. I don't know exactly what is going on under the hood, and I don't care. <laughs> it just works. And that's what's important. Now, if you're trying to be more, analytical about it from a scientific standpoint, then yeah, it matters. But it's more of a case of, hey, blood flow restrictions seem to be working for me. Great. Awesome. But even then, I don't have enough experience and knowledge with it to really go with it uh, just because I haven't really experienced much with it. And it hasn't really been a whole lot in the literature either. 
you know, it's one of those things that at this point, you know, it comes up every once in a while and then it fades away. And mentally I'm like, well, if it was really great and it actually worked, wouldn't more people be doing it and be getting a lot more positive press? Or is it something that seems to be great? And then it just was like, yeah, no. Nah. Or is it great, but it's just too difficult and painful to really use? There's a lot of stuff out there that's awesome. There's a lot of methods out there that are great. And people just don't stick with it because the cost of it is just too high. The, the approach, the setting up the equipment, you know, it really needs to be more of a practical thing. There's a lot of stuff out there that people don't stick to, even though it works. Because remember, with motivation and our motivation to do things, it's not good enough just because it works really well. It has to also work really well relative to a relatively low cost. And people quit very effective diet and exercise programs all the time, not because they're not working, but just because it's too hard. It takes too much time and too much effort and too much focus. And it's not something that they are willing to do very much. And so I wonder if that's also the case with blood flow restriction as well. Who knows? Maybe, maybe so. It could also just be the same thing where it's like, well, it does the same thing as just pushing a few more reps out. <laughs> you know, it, if the idea is that it's about that metabolic type damage, people could be like, well, just add another set. You know, a lot of times these things that can be effective are just complicated ways of doing something that's otherwise simple and, and basic. You know, sometimes there's programs out there and equipment out there and it's like, yeah, it's great, but now you took something that's really simple, basic and cheap and efficient and made it really complicated and hard and costly. It's still effective, sure, but I think in our fitness culture, we spend way too much time trying to evaluate whether or not something is effective or whether or not it works, when instead we should be looking at what is really like necessary or worthwhile. Because who cares if it works? It's more important that it's practical for most people because what's gonna be more practical is what you're gonna stick with. What's practical is what you're gonna do more of. What's practical is what you're going to put more time and energy into and the things that are more complicated and costly and stuff. And who knows? I don't know if blood flow restriction is that or not, but again, I'm looking for reasons. Why aren't more people doing it? Why, why am I going to the gym every day? I used to work in a gym where over a thousand people came in and almost, you almost never saw anybody using blood flow restriction. And I think there were like two guys one time I saw they were using it. And after a couple of months, they weren't using it anymore. So what does that say? What does that say? And it's the old adage of people are like, oh, this diet was awesome. It was great. It was wonderful. It works so well. It's like, well, then why aren't you doing it? You know? if, if it's really effective, you should be sticking with it to some degree. And, and that's really the true litmus test is who's doing it and why are they doing it as far as practicality goes. Being effective is not enough. It's a low standard, low barrier to entry. If we base things on whether or not we should do it just because it's effective, we always need to look at the costs associated as well. So speaking of costs, my friends, we are up. Oh, I got a couple more here. One more, one more. AM Creed saying, is pre-workout do, uh, do much or is caffeine the only useful ingredient? Yeah, it's pretty much just caffeine. <laughs> pretty much caffeine. Now, remember, though, that pre-workout shouldn't, I mean, ideally, pre-workout shouldn't do anything. Because you should have your diet and your lifestyle and your sleep dialed in enough so that you shouldn't need any help getting ready and amped up for your workout most of the time. Well, I mean, of course, there's going to be times where you're just not going to be up. Like, for example, it's Saturday. I fully intend to go out tonight and get drunk and spend a good amount of time with a good friend of mine. And I'm meeting another friend for a workout tomorrow. Now, yeah, I'm probably going to get some caffeine before that workout because I'm not going to be at my best. But I'm planning on that. And is that the way I usually do things? No. This is a once in a while sort of thing. And because it's once in a while, it's not really going to have much of an influence over my fitness and my outcomes. So I don't worry about it. It's good to have fun once in a while. But I'm going to be using caffeine for that. You better believe it. But at the same time, if you feel like I need pre-workout just to get this workout in, take a look at your lifestyle. Take a look at your sleep habits and your diet and things like that. You should be good to work out most days of the week to some degree. 
And if that's not the case, you have to change something. Don't lean on it as a crutch. But yeah, pre-workout's pretty much just caffeine. I personally, whenever I'm looking to get kind of amped up a little bit, I just do black tea. I find for me, that's just my perfect level of caffeine. It gets me feeling good. I feel like, oh, I'm having a good workout. I feel good. It doesn't make me like super hyper and jittery or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, just caffeine pretty much. And the, if I, uh, Michael's coming in saying, I can personally testify Matt's free content as well as his books can turn a middle-aged man completely around. I really recommend him. Thank you very much, Michael. Sincerely appreciate the props. Greatly appreciated. So yes, folks, I'm going to land this plane. Don't forget down below in the description, I got the link to the brand new RDP coaching options in person at Capra Bodyweight Training, remote coaching via Fortify, and through Ask Me for micro coaching. If you've got any little obstacles I can help you overcome or want me to look at your routine, technique improvements, all those sorts of little things, really excited about these new things, new ways for me to be able to help you on a one-to-one -one level rather than just bulk consuming my information through YouTube podcasts and my books. So thank you very much as always, folks, and I will talk to you next week. Till then, be fit and live free.